Chava Shalom. This is the Chava Sahor. It's the Chava prior to Purim. And here is when we remember, especially those uh, that they trying to attack or destroy Israel. And at the same time, we see the intervention of the Creator, blessed be his name, and, and, and uh, protecting Israel no matter what. You know, at this time, of, uh, in, in this time of the, that we are living now, and I am very sorry that just happened this week, something in New Zealand that is terrible. We as Jewish people, we do never rejoice in barbaric situations. And uh, what, what was done in New Zealand the, to this uh, uh, act of terrorism, killing 49 uh, Muslims and 24 wounded. They are innocent people. You know, the extremists, they do things, you won't take it to others. Um, in certain way, they are going to see the Muslim people who keep the, the who are uh, very quiet. I hope that they start speaking out because what is creating their silence it is, it is the worst way for these people for, to allow other people to kidnap the religion or whatever that there is and, and to create such a horrible acts. And then what happens is comes the, the counterattack of other people from the other groups that are totally also uh, sick of their mind because I don't understand other way, that they are going to do terrorist acts also the same way. You know, fire with fire is never the, the answer. And we need, to, we need to start learning to live among each other and talk to each other in, in, in a better way. But uh, it is obvious that, um, and you don't need to be a rocket scientist right now, by the way. It is very clear who are the ones that doesn't want to talk about peace. It, that's very clear. Even the, the United Nations, the European countries, and, and the Arab nations, they do not want to see it. The only group that has still, supposedly, as people without land, or they are still uh, a, in, in a situation of interns or refugees, whatever they wanted to call it, are the Palestinians for more, almost 60 years. That is not possible. And you know that if this is happening is because it's a process of the Arab people that they do not want peace. Because Israel has been offering peace from the beginning. If they accepted something that happens in 1947, 1948, they would have more territory than Israel. But no, they decided no, nothing. And they still today, Many of those groups, like Hamas, the Palestinian Liberation, all of them, they say that, this, that Israel needs to disappear, the non-existence of Israel. That's the problem. And, and, and people don't want to see it. And, and it's time that, that the, the moderate Arabs, Muslims, speak out and tell their other, their very radicals what they're doing wrong, the same way that we, the Jewish people, speak against any injustice, even if it comes from within Israel. Because in our Torah, one of the things that are very important is the Creator said, Sedek, Sedek Tirdov, justice, just the pursue. And this is something that we look for it, and we don't look for vengeance. Even the Creator said, the vengeance is mine, say the Lord. It's not ours, it's for him. And we need to start looking at it from the point of view of that not everybody is the same. Well, with that, this is the Shabbat Sahor that we need to understand why we need to remember always that the Creator is always protecting Israel. But that doesn't mean that he accepts what Israel does. And you read the prophets, you're going to see what is happening. Now, 
we, st we are getting into the third book of the Torah. And this is called Vayikra. And he called. But uh, also, it's, it's known in the Latin as Leviticus. And among the, the sages, they call it as a Torah Kohanim, or the, 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 the legislations or the principle for the, for the priest. All these names are limiting this book. We start with the basic korbanot, with the idea of korbanot, or the offerings. Sadly enough, this word not only has been mistranslated, but it has been theologized. And you know, and you're going to see terms that are going to come in different uh, translations. Like, uh, for example, propitiation, expiation, forgiveness, or things like that. You know, atoning. And all of those are interpretations, and more than interpretations, theological interpretations. What uh, we need to understand is that this word has nothing to do with propitiation, propitiation, sorry, propitiation, i repeat it again, propitiation, okay, now you know it's propitiation, it has nothing to do with atoning or, or forgiveness, but it comes to do with acknowledgement, coming to understanding, and making your relationship with the Creator correct, and, and make it with correct, make it with your neighbors, make it with the people who are around you. The wrongdoing that you are doing need to be done in the right way. You need to make it right. Now, is uh, in this area, and I, I am always grateful to Ramban, uh, my Moinidis, great rabbi, who helped me to understand a little better about this area, because sometimes it's very prejudicial, in, in the sense that many of the, the people, that they make a mockery of the Judaism as a religion. They say, you are, what is the difference between you and the pagan religions? What is the difference? You kill animal people, whatever, you know, to, to appease your God that's full of wrath. Sadly enough, in other religions, they have defined it that God needs to be pacified, needs to be at peace. And in that way, we do not confront the full wrath of him over us. You know, this, um, uh, I don't know, there are many movies that have been recently they make a movie about the Mayas and how, how they sacrifice you know, they cut the heart of the man and they throw it, uh, uh, and, and, they, and they, they kill men and, and, and human beings to pacify their gods. This is no, the only true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First of all, another idea is that we need to feed our gods. You know, our gods are so hungry that they need to eat. And you're going to see in certain places, okay, in certain religions, that they have their gods and they put food around them, you know, because uh, they need to be fed. Uh, like they are very hungry. You know, that, this is another uh, presentation or understanding. The God of Israel doesn't need to be Fed. There is a phrase here that sometimes brings to us a, a little bit, um, will be a little bit of misunderstanding. You know, reach ni hoyach la donai. That means uh, it's many times it's translated as a, a sweet, sweet savior fragrant aroma, uh, something like that. But these two words, riach and hoyach, come from two uh, shoresh or roots words. One is ruach, a spirit, 
Anihoya from the word Nahon, what is truth, good, and certain. No? And, and, and really what it means is about acceptance. That, that you have made something correct. The, 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 the creator is accepting you. And now, the word korban, where the word korbanot comes, and that is translated as a sacrifice, that's a terrible uh, translation. You know, uh, there is no in English word that we can really find the me real meaning. But uh, one of the closest that the, or less damaging will be the word offering. No? And this word offering brings the idea that I come to offer something and it changed that the supposedly. Um, what the, the creator is doing is this. Do you, uh, you know where Egypt was coming from? Egypt was coming from a, a very pagan environment. For many hundred years, they were under this environment. And they were literally influenced by them to the point that almost they are totally uh, lost in their own identity. Even they, they were no understanding or losing the perception about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Moshe Rabbeinu needed to come to make them understand who was representing and who was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to remind them because they are already almost forgotten which God they were following. Because the God of Egypt looked like they were more powerful. You know, they had uh, amazing palaces or, or temples. They had a, a lot of wealth, and they were full of gold and things very in, uh, important. And their priests, they were amazingly dressed and all those kind of things. And you're going to see that the Creator what it's going to do is, little by little, win them out of this tragedy of pagan ideas. But uh, it's very difficult to take somebody out of those ideas the, or those formations that they had grew up with. I have met many people from different religions. And many of them, they have come to our place and because they have realized that there is, there is something here new or there is different and there is a change of understanding. But uh, they have been so soaked in their heads about their own dogmas and religious prejudices that sometimes they cannot get rid of them. They are so deep inside them that they have this struggle to see it. You know, many people are afraid to, to say something against the, or to express any idea that goes contrary to the dogmas or to the traditions or the faith that they grew up. Because they have put in their heads that if they say something, something bad can happen to them. And let me tell you, I have seen that superstition not only in other religions, I can see even more in my own, in, among the Jewish people. And, and we talk about other people's superstitions. <laughs> I can tell you about the Jewish superstitions, about so many things. And we have invented so many things through the years that we have added or we have, in, in, in many ways, replaced the word of God for our own ideas. And this is what I call the problem of theologizing or substituting the word of God for human ideas. One thing is to try to understand the word of God. Another thing is to substitute the real meaning of what the, the, the Torah wants to give. And what Torah means? Principles, values, teachings, direction. And that's what the Creator wants. I have been telling you that this year, I won't go to trying to defend anything, but I'm trying to say, how do we apply 
the Torah today in our lives. I need to start with telling you that these call korbanot or offerings and these animals and, and, and also uh, dry offerings, all of this had an effect to the people at that time because they were coming from those ideas. But the, the creator needed to sanitize many of those ideas because for them it was easier to identify with something that they already knew. But they needed to take them out little by little by little. They couldn't take it in one, in one shot, in one step. And took a long time. We are in the 21st century, and you will be surprised how many of us are we still in the hocus pocus. How many of us that we are experts in internet and, and cybernetics and all these things, we are still with the hocus pocus. And the creator wants to take us out. Then, to me, the issue today is not, not to try to explain to you about what each of these uh, uh, korbanots, the five that are defined in this first Vayikra, in the first parasha, Vayikra. But uh, trying to, to put it, what will mean to us today? And how we can do korban today? Yeah, this week I had in the, in the in our, in Spanish group, you know, a, a young man, had a, a very interesting experience, and he explained me how through this experience that he went through, he was able to do what I call it a korban asham. That means an offering for guilt. And he came out. Then I was talking to Pesha, and also she came with a korban ola. And, and how is this? And how can you arrive this today in a practical way? We don't have the Beg Midash, we don't have the temple. There are many people that they are praying to bring the temple again and, and to kill more animals. Like uh, killing animals is the answer. And those people who say that, they have never read the scripture for what their value is and what it teaches, especially to read the prophets at the end when they, they, they were doing offerings, the, the priesthood, and they were terrible offerings, and they didn't care any longer about the quality of the offering, only was all was the liturgy, was the, uh, what I call it, the effect, instead to do it with the heart. And the real answer here is, what the, the creator wants is you, and you willingly, voluntarily, not being forced to do it, but do it by yourself. And you, and only you, can bring a korban to the creator. And the greatest korban that you can bring it to him is yourself. And interestingly enough, the word korban comes from the word kereb, that means to bring near, to be closer, to be close. And this is what the Creator had wanted from the beginning. That you and I, we have a personal relationship with Him, no by rituals, no by hocus pocus. But we love the hocus pocus, we love the magic. We love these things because we are more full of feelings than reasoning. And the Creator wants you to worship Him in a rational way, not full of feelings, hoping that He's going to do this or hoping that He's going to do that. 
But the reality is that he is with us no matter what. Because he is faithful, not us. And this is the difference. We fail him, but he never has failed us. Then, let me bring this together. You have the Ola, what is the burnt offering completely. Then you have the Minha, that is the, what are they call it, the dry offerings, or the vegetable offering, and on another translation, they, they translate it as the meals offerings. That really is something that also they, 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 they call the poor offerings. You know? Then comes the Shalamin, that is the peace offering, and make the right of the thanksgiving offering. And there are two more that sometimes are also mistranslated in my understanding. The Hata'ah and the Asham. The Hata'ah is translated as a sin offering. But really, that is a big, big misunderstanding about what the Creator is talking about. Sin has a, a also a theological connotation. But uh, the word hata'a means about missing the blank, missing, missing the target. No? And what it means is we deviated from the right course. And we need to turn back to the right place. We need to, we, uh, how do you say, we need to point, we need to look better the target to shoot better. You know? And the only way that we can do that is coming back again to the right place. <coughs> and third, the fifth one is the asham. That is translated as the guilt offering. And the guilt offering is, is about something that we did it. And that even that we don't think it's too bad or we don't think it, or, or nobody knows, we know. It's something about that go, uh, mi uh, missing something that we supposedly we didn't need to do, sometimes without no knowing, and we did it. And then later on we realized that we did it, and we need to make it right. I have a lot of guilt offerings to give to the Creator for many times. One time, I was in my office and somebody came to my office and said, Rabbi, I need to talk to you. And I really appreciate that person because he was, that person was very honest with me and they started telling me a lot of things that supposedly I had said to him that hurt his feelings. You know, I listened very carefully very, very carefully, and I heard his word, and he totally misunderstood me, totally. I was totally thinking that I was helping the person to be better, and he took it that was insulting him, that was diminishing him, I was being negative to him, put it down. Then I explained him what I was trying to tell him. And he was still obsessed, the no, uh, the young insulting him. Then I said to him, you know what? Please forgive me for what pain I has caused you. But my kavana, my intention, was totally clean before you. But because I hurt you, I need to apologize to you. That is in Hashem. When he heard me that I was apologizing to him, he totally changed. Well, Rabbi, we sometimes we commit mistakes, and, and then after that, the time, he started to understand what I was trying to say. 
And part also of the problem of many of us is that we refuse to see ourselves the way that we are. And this is what Corbanot is all about. It. This is a, the principle of the offerings. You see, there is a process that you bring the animal and you put your hands over the animal. It's called samach. Like, you, like in your ordination to other people. They, you're putting, you're transferring the idea. But really, it's not about transferring as people or the theologian trying to explain it. But it's about what the creator is asking us to acknowledge the thing that we have done wrong. And we are recognizing the korbanot can be also interpreted as something that is like a, a, you, you bring something when you are a, a, when, when you're invited to a home for a meal, for example, you know, and you don't come with the empty hands, and you come with something, and you offer to the, to the owners of the house, you say, thank you for inviting me, I brought this, you know, I'm bringing you something, what I make you? Co-participant. You're not buying the, uh, the, uh, the, the members of the house. You're not trying to pay them. There's no a payment. It is a sharing. And this is the idea with the korbanot. Now, why animals? If the animal is going to pay, because it is also an idea. That is a subliminal idea, I will call it. For everything that we do wrong, there are consequences. And we need to understand that when we do something wrong, somebody is going to suffer the consequences. And that we need to be aware of that. There are consequences for our actions that we need to make it right. And always it's about the idea of Teshuvah. A true Teshuvah is when you come and you acknowledge your faults, you confess that it's called Bidui, you know, and you're trying to make it right. You see, the Shuvah is not to say, I'm sorry. That would be too easy. What about if you have spoken against somebody? Do you remember when I told you that tale about this rabbi that somebody was speaking against him? And then he went back to this man who was speaking against him in the little town. He went to, he said, Rabbi, I'm sorry I have been speaking to you. Please forgive me. <coughs> and I say, okay. I want to forgive you. Uh, and then they say, but I need to do something. Oh, you want to do something? Okay. Do me a favor. Get this pillow full of feathers and take it to the middle of the plaza in, 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 in the town, in the square. Open the pillow and throw the feathers in the air. And then pick up all the feathers and bring it back. He went, he proved, threw away, he came back, very sorrow. With the big, the big pillow, a little pillow. I said, Rabbi, it's impossible to get all the feathers. And I say, 
That's it to tell you that what you have said with your mouth, you will never be able to erase it. For more sorry that you are. There are certain things that you cannot restitute to the same way. And this is why the Creator makes all this process. But also, it's very important. There is a, a word that, that you can find here in Bayekraft, in chapter four and five, but it's interesting, is about that all these faults, you know, are only exclusively for unintentional faults. Verse 27, 427. If any individual of the, of the people of Israel to commit any fault, unwillingly or involuntary, against any of these commandments, the Lord will make him free. And he said, the word here, and voluntary, it is bishkaga. And this word, and he is going to tell you that all these offerings cannot take away your fault. Cannot take away your fault from intentional sins. There's no way. You're correct when you do intentional. And what is the only way that you can return to God? And that when that happens, you can read the book, the book of Hosea, especially chapter 14. Return, return. Teshuvah, teshuvah, teshuvah. I am willing here to forgive your sins. Then, we are in a situation right now that we can be totally uh, involved with the, I call it the hocus pocus, the magic, the poof, poof. <laughs> and will this, if I do this, it's going to disappear. And the creator doesn't want that. He doesn't want formulas. We are human beings, we love to give formulas. And he doesn't speak with a language that is only for the ones that are elevated or they are in certain positions. A creator doesn't talk like a lawyers. A creator doesn't talk like a doctors. The creator doesn't talk like a theologians. Each one of them, they have their own language. In order that those ones who are not part of their group, they can understand anything that they say. And the other one that they don't understand, the only thing that they, when they, they listen to them talking, say, oh yeah, oh yeah, because they don't want to look like stupid. Dummies. They, they accept whatever they say. And you don't know if they are killing you or the, what they are doing to you. But uh, because you want to look like that, you know what they are talking about. You say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That happened many times with the scriptures. You hear the so-called very intellectual or very advanced or very uh, uh, holy people. In every religion. And they are going to tell you what you need to believe and what you need to do. And I'm going to challenge you to think in this way. Allow the Creator talk to you through His Word. To study the Word of God is nothing wrong. But don't get 
out of trying to go through the, what I call it, to the branches. Don't start flying, trying to go back to the word of God and trying to understand it. why he said what he said in the time that he said. Always very important to understand the word of God in the context, the historical background, the time that was given and why it was given to these people when they needed to hear. And then you are going to see that we do not need animal sacrifices for the forgiveness of our sins. You don't need any slaughtering of animals for our forgiveness. But what we need is, like you say in Psalm 51, King David, verse 17, I think, and more there, we say, you do not want Holocaust. You don't want sacrifices. What do you want is a contrite heart. That's all that you want. Then why we have this liturgical situation of one is is uh, uh, talking about this process of korbanot. Because the people of Israel, they needed to understand that the Creator is only one, and He doesn't need what the other gods needs, because He's the only one. You know what? Surprisingly enough, we do not need to feed our God. <laughs> He's the one that feeds us. Mm -hmm. we, we do not need to pacify Him. He the one that pacify us. Mm -hmm. We don't need to bribe him. Because that's the idea about the Holocaust. We don't need to pay him anything. Because even here, you the word, least or no, least or no, that means voluntarily. The, the, we, we, we bring things because we want. When you approach God, blessed be his name, when you approach the creator, it's because you want to approach him. He's giving you that opportunity. What a beautiful picture about this wonderful time. And let me finish with this story. One time was asked to somebody, to a, to a, to a, to a rabbi, one of the leaders said, Rabbi, how many times do we need to do teshuva? We say, one say that we need to do once a year during Yom Kippur. Another say during the Hamoedin, the the festivals, seven hamoidin, seven times a year. Another say, we need to do it every month, a new moon. The other say, no, every seven days, every Shabbat. And the other say, every new day, every day. And the rabbi say, you need to do it every time that you do something wrong. There is no a numbers, but no a time. It is no a formula. Because you are the only one that knows if you did it right or wrong. And if you do not know that you have done anything wrong, I can assure you that somebody is going to show you that you did it. And that's when you need to make it right. May the Lord bless you and keep you and keep his shalom be with all of you. Shabbat shalom.